how you think about studying behavior. And to start that, I want to tell you uh, a story that totally changed how I think about behavior, studying behavior. Um, my background is very much in research and design, so I started like, as an industrial designer, I worked with Dyson for a while, so if you guys have vacuum cleaners from Dyson, you, there's probably some random plastic part that I spent a long time wondering if it could be manufactured in Malaysia or somewhere like that. Um, and then I went to work to, uh, as Annie mentioned, Flow Interactive. Um, I did a lot of research there, I did a lot of usability tests, I think I did about three or 400 usability, one-on-one -on -one usability tests. And I worked at, uh, went and worked at Google where I did a lot of uh, more formative research, a lot of in-home visits, a lot of contextual research, uh, a lot of exploratory research. And when I joined Facebook, I, I, I joined a research and design team. Um, I, I was really interested in branding and, and how, how brands are built and how the things that we all think about every day, user experience, is, is moving into that world. And so the job spec I had was a little, little bit weird. It was, um, it was kind of a come and work here and see what you want to do and we'll all figure it out. Uh, which is a little bit uh, how Facebook works. And it was interesting because the first thing I did, uh, very naturally, I'm sure this would be your natural intuition as well, is to, is to start doing research to understand how people are uh, using the product, how it relates to brands, how it relates to advertising, perceptions of people uh, when it comes to advertising. And I did a research study. Uh, it was a pretty quick and dirty tactical research study. I had you know, eight to 10 recommendations I felt pretty strongly about them. I'd seen this stuff myself. It was very emotive. I really wanted people to change some parts of the product roadmap. Uh, some were bigger things, some were smaller things. And then something interesting happened. I, uh, I changed jobs. So I, I moved out of the research and design team and I became a product manager. And um, I actually became the product manager for the exact area that I'd just done research for. So suddenly I was sitting there uh, with this research report with some a lot more autonomy and decision making power to execute some of the things that I was recommending. So it was incredibly weird. I was basically recommending things to myself. And the the thing that, that totally changed how I think about a lot of research and design in this space and product development is that I suddenly decided that I shouldn't be doing some of the things that I told myself to do. Right? And this all happened in the space of a couple of weeks. And it's pretty, pretty dramatic because all that really happened was my perspective had changed. And over the course of being a product manager, I was a product manager for about a year, uh, it turned out I was good at some parts and really terrible at other parts of it, and I missed design a lot, so then I went back to being, uh, doing more, much more design work, which is what I'm doing now. Um, it changed how I think about research, and it changed how I think about studying behavior. Um, so what I want to do uh, this morning is basically take you through um, some of the big uh, patterns that, that we're seeing in the world. Um, I spent the last four years living in Silicon Valley, I just moved back to Dublin. Um, and there's very, very predominant themes that are driving a lot of investment and product development and startups and big companies there. So I want to take you through those because I think um, they'll have a pretty dramatic impact, not only about how we think about studying behavior, but also on what our jobs are. I think our jobs are, are going to change. The types of things that we do are going to change. You can already see some of this happening uh, at some of the big technology companies. So that's the plan. Um, I, I, I love this quote, I often start with this. Uh, this is um, William Gibson, who's a science fiction author. The future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. So what, I want to, what I'm trying to do is show you what I think that future is. Uh, these are my opinions on the future, and if you ever get up on a stage and say, these are my opinions about the future, you have to follow that with. I might be totally wrong. Right, so uh, these are just things, I think they're, some of them are, de they're all debatable, obviously. Some are more debatable than others. There's more evidence for some than there are for others. Um, but I think they ask some really profound questions of our, uh, our industry and our role in building products and growing businesses. So this is what I'm going to go through. Um, there's basically five things. Uh, the internet is permeating everything. We're moving towards a web oriented around people. This term social will go away. Mobile is not about technology or phones or tablets. It's about access to information. And we're actually seeing this exponential increase in information. So I'm going to go through those five things. And then look at design process in this world. How, does, how, does, how do these themes change what our jobs are, or what our jobs should be? So let's start with this one. The internet will permeate everything. Some people call this the internet of things. I don't, I don't really know. I actually really don't really know what that means. And um, this is the way that I describe it. And uh, there are better and worse ways of describing these things. But if you look around you, like nobody, I'm sure nobody, when you can walk in that door, walked in, into this lecture theater and thought things like, wow, I'm really glad the electricity works in here. 
right? Or, oh, the lights are on, that's good, you know, glad the electricity is powering the lights. Right? That's not the way we think about things, that electricity is invisible to us. And that's the, way that, that's the way people are starting to think about the internet. If you look at younger generations, people don't think about things like going online or think about w web things, whether it's an app or a website or whatever, as a destination. It's already happening to all of us as well. Like when you take out your phone and start using apps or checking stuff, you're not consciously thinking about going online. Right? And so the internet is going to, you know, in many ways, very, very fast, become something that we don't think about a lot. It's going to be assumed and it's going to permeate all parts of society. Um, we're going to end up with a network of information about anyone and anything that's available anywhere and anytime. And it's going to dramatically change not only business, but society. It's already happening. I think Nike is an amazing example of this, where effectively the internet is in the clothes and shoes that they build. And this company, remember, is a company that basically makes running shoes and running gear. That's their, that's their legacy. Um, they're also fantastic brand marketers and they're fantastic advertisers. But they're starting to put the internet in all of the things that they do. So I'm not sure how many of you guys use Nike Plus, but it's a pretty transformational experience. They're, by putting the internet into the things you're wearing, you're suddenly creating all this value that you can build products and services on. Uh, that effectively, you know, build brands over time. I think it's in homes, right? There's lots, lots of examples of the internet permitting homes. I think Nest is a fantastic example. I don't know if many of you guys have looked at Nest. I encourage you to. Uh, it's a it's a thermostat which basically learns your behavior in your home over time and dynamically adjusts the environment in your home over time. Philips are doing stuff like with with lighting as well. Again, because the stuff is connected to the internet, it can learn your behavior over time, dynamically change your environment over time. It knows when you're coming home, the lights go on, the heat goes up to the temperature that over time it has learned that you prefer. I'm sure many of you guys use, use Halo, which I think is an amazing, amazing service. It's one of the best examples for this idea that the internet would permeate everything. It totally, oh, the, the, Halo is basically the internet in taxis, and it totally changes the experience. All those businesses, all those local cab offices uh, where you call them and then you uh, order a cab, they're not going to exist in a few years. I think, I think they have a very, very short lifespan left ahead of them, two or three years maybe at best. And money, Square, right? There's lots and lots of products and services where it, it, historically, if you wanted to build a business, you had to have a cash register. If you wanted to build a big retail store, you had to have a lot, a lot of point of sale systems, really, really complicated, big, big uh, operational e efforts, big, you know, high cost, it was really, really complicated. Now, if you want to set up a shop, you basically just, well, you, I guess you rent some, figure out what you want to sell, rent a space, and that's all you need. That's all you need to start buying and selling services. It's just something that's, it's not a big cash register anymore, it's something that's connected to the internet. It totally changes the types of things that business can do. And the types of data that they're collecting over time, the types of ways they can personalize their business to individuals in the future. And the last example I have is weight. So uh, this is the ARIA scale for Fitbit, which I think is an also incredibly interesting startup. This is pretty simple. You basically step on the weighing scales and it sends that information to the cloud and it's stored. So all you do every morning is get on the scales, it starts to record your weight over time and suddenly you can build amazing products and services on top of that. All it is is a weighing scales connected to the internet. And so I think you're gonna see this more and more and more. The internet is gonna permeate all parts of life, all parts of the homes that we live in, the cars we drive, the places we go, the restaurants we, we eat in. So we're gonna to head towards a world that looks a little bit like this. It's a world where everything will be personalized and connected and it'll be available everywhere. So that's the first thing, the internet's permeating everything. The second thing is that the internet is being rebuilt around people. So the best way, I, the kind of best frame I have for describing this or thinking about this is actually to look back. Um, you know, one of the, with Facebook, there's, there's, uh, Facebook's unprecedented in many ways in terms of a, a business, in terms of a company, in terms of scale, with over a billion active users. <laughs> Often to try and understand why that is and why so many people come back every single day. Um, you know, well over half of our user base come back every single day. Uh, is to, uh, many people actually start looking backwards to understand where we are. And if you actually, you know, very, very, this is very, obviously a very crude diagram. I think if Genevieve's talk was over that side of the stage, my history of humanity is over, very far over there. Um, basically, uh, you, you go back 30,000 years ago to the oldest record that we have of uh, people externalizing their thoughts onto some, some medium. And if you think about the internet, it's incredibly new. In fact, a lot of the technologies that we take for granted all the time are incredibly, incredibly new. 
things like the telegraph, which was an incredibly transformational <coughs> technology, we don't even think about it every day today. Uh, it's, all, it's quite new in, in the grand scheme of things. And so to really understand why the internet has been re rebuilt around people, why it's changing so fundamentally, I'm going to show you that uh, in a second, you've got to understand that we are a human, we are a social species. Right? That is, we, we, every part of your life you go out, you interact with other people, you talk to other people, you think about other people, even very, very deep personal private things like your sense of identity are oriented and structured and changed by the interactions that you have with others. So it makes sense that the, this technology that is brand new, that is 20 years old, would reorient itself and rebuild itself around this idea that we are a social species. So I, I kind of view the first 20, like the first 20 years of the web as beta, right? I'm sure I, I, I learned my craft in this world, I'm sure many of you guys did as well, where we had information architecture, we had web pages, we basically figured out what web pages should go together, you know, what links to what, it was all about content. It was all about a pretty solitary experience, people going online, going on a computer, accessing a website, figuring out um, what pages link to what. And I, I still see this as the predominant way that people talk about design and do design. There's certainly lots to talk about other ways of doing design, but I, you know, a large part of my job is working with external agencies, be they creative ad agencies, design consultancies, design shops. And I, the predominant thing I still see is 80 page PDFs of screens showing what screen goes to what screen. Right? I, I don't know how many of you guys, that is the, the major artifact you produce um, that's certainly the one that I see the most often still. That's building for this world. And I think it's increasingly making yourself and your skill set more obsolete as things change. So instead, I think this is a, a, an illustration of where we're going. So it's, every time, instead of you kind of going to a website or going to a destination and being served all this content, all this information architecture, instead what's happening is anytime data is served to you, whether that's through a web app, through a native app, through um, a website on your computer, laptop, phone, it doesn't really matter. Anytime data is served to you, and in your home, in taxis, wherever, when you, when you stand on that scale, um, you're basically bringing with you a set of information. You're bringing with you information about your friends, who they are, and how, how much you care about them. You're bringing information about your interests, and you know, how, what you're interested in, how much you're interested in it. And you're bringing information about your friends' interests. And, Increasingly, you know, in the near future, it's certainly happening already today, um, you decide whether or not to share that information with all these businesses, depending on whether you trust them. And the more you trust them, and the more it makes sense, the more that the value exchange is really clear. Oh, you guys are asking for my phone number, that's incredibly personal to me. Oh, of course, you guys need to ring me to confirm these tickets that I'm buying. Once it's in context, it makes sense, you trust the business, people decide to share that information. And when they share that information, you can build incredibly interesting, powerful things. So I'm going to show you guys an example, which I think is the best example, one of the best examples that I have to illustrate this. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with Etsy, which is a, 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 an e-commerce site where people make things and they can sell them to people. So this is, uh, this is a screenshot of uh, the homepage of Etsy from a while ago. And by, any, by most user experience measures, it's pretty good. I think it's really, really nice. It, it's very clear what's going on. We've got uh, a left-hand navigation with all the categories of, of goods. We've got some stuff that's highlighted. The na global navigation is pretty clear. It looks good, the grid is nice, and so on, right? Can't really complain. However, if you think about what people are trying to do, one of the predominant things we're trying to do in Etsy is buy stuff for other people. So if you imagine a story where I'm trying to buy something for my brother, who's uh, uh, a little bit younger than me. He's in his like, uh, mid to late 20s. When I come to Etsy, it starts to get a bit hard. First of all, everything is purple. So if Neil doesn't like purple, I'm already uh, uh, struggling. We have some vegan soap for Neil, who's, Neil, by the way, is like in a band, thinks he's a bit of a hipster, <coughs> he's very cool. He, he'd fit right in here, by the way. Uh, <laughs> vegan soap, or maybe he would like vegan soap. But down the bottom left, we have some lingerie, we've got some cushions, like if Neil wants the lingerie, certainly me giving it to him would be incredibly weird, <laughs> brother. So this is hard, right? It's, it starts to get hard, and the left-hand nav isn't really helping that much because there's so many categories, I don't really know where to start. So Etsy did this really interesting thing where there's a thing down at the bottom left, gift ideas, right? So you, and this is just an experiment that they ran. You click on gift ideas, it basically connects to Facebook, and this could be, you know, I'm not talking specifically about Facebook today, this could be any social platform. It connects to Facebook, you authenticate Etsy and decide if, you know, if, assuming you trust them, and it basically brings this box up that says, who do you want to shop for? Like, oh, well, I'm shopping for Neil, my brother. I type Neil's name in, I hit OK, 
and it changes to this. Gift ideas for Neil. Well, Neil likes Bill Murray. Here's stuff about that at all different price points. And very embarrassingly, Neil likes SpongeBob SquarePants. Here's lots of stuff about that. Here's a baby. That might execute. I mean, the reason why. A bit cooler. He likes True Blood. This goes on and on and on. And this is a transformational change in the product. It's a transformational change in my experience of it. Uh, it's transformational in, in the things and the value that I can bring by buying Neil something that he probably likes more than some random thing that I hope and pray he might like. I think it's going to change other things too. So the news very soon, and this is starting to happen, will look a little bit like this, where you have world headlines and local headlines just like you do today. But 80%, 70, 80% of that page will be personalized content. It will be news based on your interests, news your friends have read, news people like you have read. And the reason that I, I feel this is inevitable is because, first of all, it's a far better experience for you. For any time you go on BBC, for example, today, open up BBC News right now, 80% of that stuff isn't really that interesting to you. Imagine a BBC where you open it up and 80% of that stuff is personalized to you. That is a totally different product experience and it will see much higher engagement rates. TV will look like this. Hey Paul, here's movies and shows your friends have watched recently. Here's content your friends saved for you to watch. Here's your friends' favorite shows and so on. And, I, and again, I, I don't know about you guys, I think, and, and I apologize if anybody works at, uh, on TV box sets, but open, turning on my TV and seeing 999 channels is one of the worst user experiences I can think of. It's like, I have no idea what's on, so I'll just keep watching the same rubbish that I watch every day. I'm sure there's loads of better stuff on, but like, arbitrarily 999 because the box set didn't do 1,000 or whatever, I'm not really sure why. Um, this is a far better experience. There's 20 things on here, you're likely to probably want to watch 15, 16 of those. It's just personalized, um, and it's gonna see, again, higher engagement rates. So that's the second thing, that the web is being rebuilt around people, uh, and people as filters for all the content that's there. The third thing is that the so this, this idea of social will go away. So one of the biggest things, um, and again, this totally changes how you think about building products. Uh, one of the things that I get asked the most um, by all the partners I work with is, is kind of help, help me understand social behavior, which is kind of a crazy question. Or, you know, how do I get people to share my stuff more? How do I get them to, you know, click like button and, and do all that stuff more? And this is crazy because abstracting this idea of social makes no sense at all. It's actually making it much harder to develop products because, again, we're a social species. It's not like I turn around to you guys and say, or turn around to my friend and say, hey, you know, you're organizing dinner party for Friday night. You're like, yeah, it's going to be great. Hey, can you make sure it's social? Like, that is not, I hope, what you say to people. <laughs> or, you know, you don't turn to your friends and say, hey, hey what were you doing last night? It's like, oh, I was online, I was sharing. <laughs> that is not how we talk, that is, yet that is, that is exactly how we're approaching business and it is exactly how we're approaching product development and that is exactly how people are approaching research. You know, people are trying to figure out, oh, what are the things people share? Let's study that. And actually, that's the wrong question. All these things are means to an end. But if you look, just look at Facebook, we've liked, we've commented, we've shared, we've got three options. These are just means to an end. Right? These are just ways in which to help people talk. So the real question is, why do people talk? This idea, this term, social, will go away. As, as, as social web, the web. Social business will be business. Right? We're in this weird <coughs> temporary period. I think um, some of, yeah, people like Jenny, even some of the anthropologists in the audience might be horrified at what I'm about to say. But one of the biggest challenges I've had over, over the years <coughs> is, if you think about social behavior, if you think about behavior in general, it's incredibly complicated, and it's incredibly complex, and there's so many confounding things that it's really hard to truly tease out why people are doing the things that they're doing. And what I, you know, you can take different approaches to this. The approach that, because, and this is probably because I'm a trained designer, I'm not a trained researcher. I, I learned that craft kind of along the way. Um, I, I try and simplify and simplify and simplify things to make them actionable. All I care about is if I give you some research insight, do you know what to draw? That was my measure of kind of, is this research useful to people? Can you draw something? Here's research, can you draw something from this? If people can draw something, then we're getting somewhere. If we need to have an hour long intellectual debate about the research insight, that's really interesting for the pub. That's not really interesting for the CEO or CMO or the people who own the business or the product manager or your client. 
who just want to make stuff and make money and grow their business. So I've simplified this to, with apologies to every anthropologist out there, I've simplified this to three things um, that I think are much better frames for thinking about, about this space. So the first one is identity. And this is, at a very simple level, this idea that people want to feel unique. All of us are, are unique. All of us want to have people perceive us in a, in a certain way. And the things that we decide to say, the things that we decide to do, the, the places we decide to go, whether or not we check in, whether or not we share photos, who we share them to the audience, all of those things are driven in, in some part by how we want other people to perceive us. And slightly paradoxically, we also want to feel connected. We want to feel part of something bigger, part of a movement, part of a community, part of a family, part of a close group of friends. We have this innate desire to be connected to all the people around us and to hope and pray that there's something bigger happening in the world. That there's some, and this gets a bit deep, so I'll stay out of that. But that there's something more, there's something more meaningful, that oh, this, this collective uh, group of us um, is headed, to, headed for something else. And these things, this, this desire to feel unique and different, and this desire to feel connected, uh, are hard to design for because they're kind of in conflict with one another. But they're the two predominant things to, to, to think about. Not why do people share stuff, it's more how do they perceive themselves? How can we help people tell the story of their life? How can we help people make connections with other people? How can we help them maintain the relationship with their family, their closest friends? How can we make them, uh, help them make new connections? And the third thing is once you've kind of figured that out, we've got identity over here, we have connectedness over here. The third part of it is, how do we facilitate communication between those people? And the most interesting and useful thing that I've found um, to think about this, and again, incredibly complicated topic to think about human communication, is that if you, if you study this, that ultimately people communicate for the most part in, in many lightweight interactions over time. And that is not how people are approaching product design for the most part today. Most people are building big, immersive experiences and focusing on trying to get people immersed in something, to spend more time in something, to be really engaged in something. You know, the fact that they will be in their bedroom, on their computer, lost in this amazing, cool thing that I built. And you know, if you think back to how the web is changing, you're, you're designing for something that's going away. You're designing for something, this idea of a destination and immersive experience is something that isn't where product development is headed. Right? Product development is headed towards you know, the, the Fitbit scale and Halo and all these interconnected things. And the internet being all around us, not something you go on. So this idea is really powerful. And a lot of the things that we design, a lot of the things that we decide to build are all lightweight, right? This idea that there are many lightweight interactions over time. And the aggregation of those interactions is greater than the sum of the parts. My, one of the best examples I think is Spotify. So Spotify created with Facebook and people started publishing all the songs they listened to. And lots of people complain about that, like it's a load of rubbish, random noise, I don't really, I don't care what my friends are listening to. And serendipitously, sometimes it is interesting. So recently, a colleague of mine was caught listening to Justin Bieber. So uh, I hope some of Justin Bieber fans in the audience. Um, because what I pursued wasn't positive for her. Um, so sometimes we get some serendipitous value out of those, all those many exchanges. What's more interesting though is the, aggregate, uh, the aggregation of, the, of that. So if, we, if Spotify knows all the songs you listen to, then they know your favorite bands. And they know the bands you're discovering. And they know the bands your friends are discovering. So suddenly Spotify can say, our partners of theirs build on their platform can say, hey, you like this band, and so does this guy, and you're just discovering them, and they're in town. And here's tickets, and here's merchandise, and here's a whole bunch of other products and services that I can't even imagine. Right? The aggregation of these things is really powerful. Friendships develop the same way, but it will suddenly become best friends with somebody overnight. It takes years, sometimes it takes years, it takes weeks and months of many interactions over time before we really figure out who we want to spend more time with, who we like the most, love the most, and so on. So that's the third thing. Um, this idea of social is going away. The fourth is that mobile is about access to information. So, um, you know, the predominant thing, mobile is obviously a huge theme, it's talked about at length, both in our industry and elsewhere. Most people can't figure it out. And most business owners have no idea what it is. You know, they, they are asking for us to help them navigate that world. And uh, what's really interesting is most people talk about technology. They talk about Android and iPhone iPhone and SDKs and all this stuff, tablet, you know, all, the, all the stats you see are like, 
there's people using tablets and tablets are going up and iPhones are going this way and you know more and more people are spending more time on these devices and they're talking about technology and I think that is an incredibly misleading path to go down. And when you think about studying behavior, we are as guilty of this probably as everybody else. I'm sure that there are many people, many of us here in our industry, answering research questions that are framed in terms of technology. We've got to learn about tablet usage. We've got to figure out when people are using tablets and when they're using phones and why that matters and why we should prioritize our, tab our iPad experience, our iPhone experience, or whatever it is, or even the web app instead. Right, they're the types of things a lot, a lot of people are thinking about. And the best way I have, I have of describing this is basically stolen from Ben Horowitz, who's an investor in Silicon Valley, who was basically got a, was asked to get on stage Web 2.0 a few years ago and explain the future of mobile, which he basically said is uh, the worst brief for a talk ever. Because I'm kind of doing it here, but talking about the, the future, you're bound just to be wrong about a lot of stuff. But he gave this analogy that I thought was amazing. And I, I, you might have heard me say this before, I've been saying before, I've stolen it, and like I tell everyone, I think it's just phenomenal. So he basically compared the place we're in now with mobile technology as being very similar to when the car was invented. So when the car was invented, you've got to remember that before the car, people are literally just horses and carts. If, you know, if I wanted to like, give you something or send you something, I had to like, well, maybe get it to a steam engine or a train, but that, that probably went via a horse and cart. And people are going around cities, they're walking, they're cycling, and there's horses and carts everywhere. And this thing starts going down the street, right? And there's no steam coming out of it. It's incredibly, what, like, what is it? How does it work? And people were pretty obsessed with the technology, the combustion engine. This was like a radically new, different thing. And that's where we are today. We are obsessed with mobile technologies and obsessed about the specs of these things, and tablets versus phones versus laptops, etc. If you think about the invention of the car, the technology and the car in and of itself is not nearly as important as the fact that it changed how we live because it created suburbia. It changed the fabric of many communities in many parts of the world. And it changed commerce. It fundamentally altered the economics of buying and selling things because suddenly it was feasible to build a warehouse on the edge of town for incredibly cheap and use car infrastructure, roads to, and trucks to basically deliver goods from anywhere in the world to those places at incredibly low prices. And so and enough consumers can all go and drive uh, out to these places, and local businesses found it very hard to stay in business because their overheads were higher. So totally altered economics uh, of commerce and led to big box retail. And I feel mobile technologies are going to do the same. We are already in a world where um, you, almost anywhere you can take a phone out of your pocket and look up things like, how much is this thing? elsewhere. How much is it down the street? How much is it online? Who else bought it? Which of my friends like this brand? Is this brand trending up? Is it trending down? Is it cool? Is it not? You know, I think more and more we'll see a lot, a lot, a lot more diverse information, like is this company ethical? Where's their factory? What are their values? Like, it's infinite. It goes on and on and on. And it's going to fundamentally change, I believe, the way people make decisions about what businesses to interact with and what products to buy and services to buy. This is an amazing chart to kind of like round this home. Um, this is uh, stolen from Mary Meeker. So on the left is units sold, and the bottom is weeks from launch. This is the th Apple's three main products from the last few years. So here's the iPod. Ten weeks after launching the <coughs> iPod, uh, they sold kind of two, three million iPods. Pretty good. Here's the iPhone. Ten weeks from launch, they sold 37, 38 million iPhones. Right? That's also really impressive. There's the iPad. So ten weeks after launching the iPad. Apple had sold close to 100 million units. And what's really important about this is not the devices. What's important is more and more companies are going to build more and more of these things that, that are in our pockets and in our bags and come with us and are wearable. Like I have a Nike fuel band on right now, right? It's tracking my movement and reporting that. And uh, I run, so it's kind of all intertwined in that ecosystem. More and more people are going to build more and more of this stuff. It's going to be everywhere, and that is the world that all of us have to design for. That is the world that we need to study, and that is the world that we have to design for. And it's going to change our jobs in a few fundamental ways that I'm going to cover at the end. The second thing to remember is that, aside from about mobile being about access to information, is that most people in the world have never, ever used the internet. Right? Four and a half billion people in the world have no access to the internet. Most, I believe, will have access to it in, within the next kind of 10 years, probably by the end of the decade most of these people are going to access it on things that they carry with them. So if you think about the future of business, the future of the businesses that you work with, 
And if any of those businesses are looking at emerging economies in other parts of the world and expansion, this is the world you're designing for. It is not a world where you've got nice big screens. The creative canvas, the design canvas, predominantly for all of us, uh, as far as the future as I can think, is something that is tiny and in your hand. And it's, it's an ecosystem. It's not, a, it's not a destination. It's not something you drive traffic to. Um, th this, is an, this is kind of made up, but this is, a, uh, <laughs> this is my caveat. Um, it's my unscientific, this is a, as scientific as I get sometimes. Um, but I think it's a really, really important chart. It's pretty simple. We've got usage of whatever, usage of your product, whatever, whatever you guys make, and time. Right? So there's desktop. If you look at almost all products in the world, desktop usage looks like that. It's still going up as more and more people come online, more and people still buy laptops and things like that. So desktop usage typically is going up on a pretty gradual curve. It's OK. It's growing. It's not necessarily huge. And then most people launched a web, ver a mobile version after that, right? So it started later, but this is what they see, right? They see this exponential growth curve. And, then, and this dotted line, I think, is where most businesses are today. This crossover is incredibly, incredibly important. That is the time when more people are using your product and service on mobile devices than on desktop devices. Facebook's already past that point, right? We have more people using Facebook on mobile devices than we do on desktop devices. And it just, I'm just trying to illustrate how critically, critically important it is for everybody here to stop looking at these big giant screens and designing things in that, in that, with that frame and start thinking about tiny screens and people moving everywhere. Right? Assume movement. Assume people are constantly on the move. Assume they're bumping into people, whether that's digitally or physically, and assume that it's in this tiny, tiny screen. Okay, so the last thing um, before I get into how this is going to change our jobs, I think, is, uh, is that information is increasing exponentially. This is pretty self-explanatory. Um, the amount of information being published is, is just going up and up and up, right? And that's largely driven by mobile technologies. More and more people are publishing more and more and more content. Um, places they go, photos, uh, music they listen to, check-ins, uh, a lot of pictures of food. I've no, I've, not really sure why we put a lot of pictures of food, but we do. Uh, probably some deep innate uh, uh, motivation that we all have to eat to survive. Right? But the amount of information published is going up exponentially. And <laughs> our access to that information is also going up exponentially. So I grew up in the world, I'm sure many of you guys did, where we had 24 encyclopedias in our house. And uh, my parents bought them in good faith. And they, 20 years later, could be sold as, as good as new. Right? We never, ever opened those things. But that was the boundary of our information. That was, I could go to the library potentially and there's more information, but this is not the world in which people are growing up in today. It's not the world in which all of us live in today. And increasingly as more people come online, it's not the world that, that they will live in. We have access to all this information anywhere that we go. Um, this is a photograph from a pretty remote part of Southeast Asia. If you have a phone connection, you can access information about anybody, anywhere, anytime, any information about products, businesses, service, services, people, relationships, and so on. The challenge for all of us when we think about designing for this world is that our memory is going to stay the same within our lifetime. Right? Our brain evolves incredibly slowly. Our capacity for memory, our capacity for um, remembering things and remembering relationships between things, um, our capacity for remembering people and who they are, um, unless mediated through a phone or some some other technology device, it's going to stay the same. And that is a really big challenge for us. It's something that is incredibly important for us to always have in our heads and understand. Right? Everything you design and build is in a world that is competing for attention with millions and millions and millions of other things. What's really interesting is that what, we're, what we see a lot, and what a lot of other people see, is that to filter the sea of information, this overwhelmingly large body of content, people are turning to other people. Mostly turning to their friends and families, but also sometimes turning to other people they don't know that have credibility in a certain space. And the reason that I, this is again, it's something that we can't necessarily prove, but the reason that I believe this is happening is because it is deeply hardwired into our brain. Right? It's how our species survived over time. We shared information with one another about what to eat, uh, what eats you, where to plant crops, weather patterns, villages, communities, who's your enemy, who's your friend, right? It's so deeply hardwired for us to communicate and share information with other people that that is naturally, that is our gut, guttural reaction to overwhelming content is to turn to other people and ask them to filter it for us. 
And you guys have had this experience a million times over. Okay, so there, there, there are kind of five big things. The internet will permeate everything. It's been rebuilt around people, not content. This term social will go away. It will be part and parcel of every single thing that all of us design and build. Um, mobile is not about technologies. It is about access to information. And that volume of information is increasing exponentially. So we've got these five macro patterns that are defining the, play, the spaces that we will have to design in. It looks a little bit like this. We have all these companies on, on the left-hand side, Facebook, Google, Twitter. We've got product analytics from, our, from the things we build and looking at Google Analytics and things like that for app usage. We've got data aggregators. We've got loyalty programs that track what we buy. Right? Retailers are tracking what people buy all the time. We're kind of good at predicting it. Credit card companies know where you go, what you buy. They know a phenomenal amount of information about you. People are aggregating this and so on and so on. And on the other hand, we have, we have the more human aspect of We have people uh, who their friends are, what their interests are, are, what their friends' interests are, and so on. And this is, this is the world in which we need to design and build things, right? The world in which the, all of us increasingly uh, starting, already started, is to figure out how we make things that are useful and valuable and appropriate for people, given this really complex dynamic on both sides. So what I would put to you is that, and may, this may be surprising, it may be common sense, I don't know. All of us, there may be some exceptions, but almost all of us in this audience and in our industry are designing complex, dynamically changing, and for the most part, social systems. And that is not necessarily the things that we built or designed to grow our profession. Or a lot of us built human-computer interaction things. And more and more and more, we're going to be building human-to-human -human things. And they're going to be complex, and they're going to be dynamically changing. And it's going to slightly change how we approach work. <coughs> so I don't know if you guys notice what's going on in this picture. There's a guy on the left who's uh, doing something that uh, not all of us notice at the start. So if you try and understand how to design stuff, in this dynamically changing, complex place, one of the best places to start is to look at cities and look at things like urban planning. So many of the designers of Facebook are really interested in architecture and urban planning and how cities have evolved. And people study this stuff at length, they talk about it at length, because the only real example we have in the world of a complex, dynamically changing social system is urban environments. And this is just something that I think is incredibly important for all of us to think about. So I think there's like five or six things that, I, that I'm going to leave you guys with. And again, you can debate these. Um, this is just my opinion based on the stuff that I've seen happen, both in Silicon Valley and in our industry over the last few years. The first thing is you can't design a dynamically changing social system by drawing UI, or by drawing screen states. And I said earlier, that's still what I see. That's still I still, the predominant thing that I see coming out of design, design firms is 70 page PDFs. Here's, here's, our, here's our wireframe diagram at the beginning of our information architecture, <laughs> then here's all the screens and here's how they all relate to each other. But that doesn't illustrate anything that's changing or dynamic. It's impossible to talk about dynamically changing things, or real time changing things, or social systems, or indeed any system by showing people static content. And in the same way, you can't design a dynamically changing social system in Photoshop, or OmniGraffle, or whatever tool most of you guys, a lot of you guys probably use, right? And I've been guilty of this. The reason I'm sharing these things is because I've been guilty of every single one of these, I should also say. Um, and, and other smarter people than me told me how I was doing it wrong and backwards. Um, I spent a lot, I use Fireworks, I spent a lot of time designing stuff in Fireworks until I realized it was kind of pointless. Because when you start building stuff, you realize that you know, we have this phrase in Facebook that Photoshop lies, right? You guys are, as, I'm sure all of you are as guilty of this as I was or I am and as each other, right? Your mocks, your design comps look beautiful, right? Who sends ugly design comps to clients? But you can't design this stuff in Photoshop in a static tool. Uh, you can't communicate it with a PDF. Because changing one part of the system changes the rest, 
you need to build working prototypes that use real data. And that is one of the biggest challenges I had when I was a researcher studying this, was that unless I studied existing tools, unless I studied how people use Facebook, how people are using Twitter, how people are using their phone, getting them to take out their phone, let's look at their records of who they called, why they called them, who those people were, who they're texting, all that stuff. If we wanted to test future ideas, new things, we had to have working prototypes that use real data because there's so much subtlety and nuance in the relationships people have and in the dynamically changing states of these systems. Because changing one part of the system changes the rest, you need to design against metrics. And this is, uh, I'm sure it's controversial, I've had many debates with this with people. You know, I grew up in a world of personas and scenarios and goals and tasks and, and all the stuff that Cooper talked about, like loved it, drank it. When I was at Flow in particular, I preached from the mountain to every client I could find. When I was at Google, I also did a lot of it. I haven't built a persona in years, or I haven't used personas in years. And, um, one of the reasons is because it's really hard to design very specific things against them. I think a much better way in this really complex environment that we're headed is to look at metrics, look at the types of metrics that people care about, that businesses care about, and design against them. And that is against almost every intuition as a creative professional in our body. But I think it is incredibly, incredibly important to embrace. Because if you design against metrics, you can be incredibly specific about the types of things that you want, to, that you need to create. I think there's two more of these. Because you can never predict social behavior, you need to build and shift as soon as possible. The amount of times I did so much qualitative research, I did, I did so much work trying to understand whether or not a product would work. Um, I mean, I, I worked on Gmail, I worked on, on YouTube, I worked on Google Buzz, which some of you may or may not remember. Uh, <laughs> Obviously, uh, I worked on Google Plus and Facebook, and we studied and studied, and we did so much research. We did, I can't describe to you how much research we did. And every time we shipped something, we would be totally surprised at what happened. Right? Not that our research was wrong or misleading, it was just that we couldn't predict these things. These are complex systems, and it's incredibly hard in a very small qualitative study to actually understand how people will react with real data. Just you know, putting in people's fake data, it just does not cut it. You have to have real data, real friends, real relationships. Because you can never predict emergence, you need to build and ship as soon as possible. So many of these systems, when built and shipped, start to show emergent properties. It's incredibly important. Things, things that, are, that, you, that you could never have foreseen before start to happen. And that you can only learn that by building and shipping and making a real thing and giving it to real people in the real world. And the last one is because you need to ship as fast as possible, you have to change how you approach research. And I have a little diagram to illustrate this. So what I would, what I would put forward, and by the way, this is my opinion. Facebook has a really big research team. A lot of, we do a lot of qualitative research, we do a lot of formative research. This is just, this is just my opinion. For, I think for most businesses, and uh, most people starting to design these complex systems, this is what I would put forth. Build a hypothesis. There's so much existing research in the world on identity, connectedness, social systems, urban planning, uh, city development. There's so much research on this in this space. You don't need to go off and start doing new things. A lot of those questions, as, as, as well as you can ever answer them, have been answered. So start there, synthesize existing research, and build a hypothesis. And then build it as fast as possible. Simple product, as fast as possible. Launch it, ship it, real, to the real people in the real world with real identity and real friends and real data, and then start to measure it and iterate it, and start looking at those metrics that you were designing against. Is it changing? Because when you launch it, you'll start to see that the metric you were designing against is going up, and, you're, and people are celebrating you until you realize that this other metric over here is going way down. Right? And once you have a complex system, metrics changing here means metrics are changing there. Right? This is not um, infinite. So it's incredibly important. And the last thing I would say is to push code daily or weekly. Change this every single day if you possibly can. Learn, measure, and move as fast as possible. And especially if you work in a big company, in a big technology company, this is more and more and more important because the cost of product development is basically plummeted to zero. There are startups all over the world who understand this product development cycle and will be able to ship and learn faster than you can. So that's it. Understand the ecosystem, know what metrics matter, sketch on paper, build working prototypes, ship, and then analyze and iterate. 
Um, I want to leave you guys with this last quote um, from Reed Hoffman's Diner of LinkedIn. If you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late. So thank you. <laughs>